various different uh, domains. <clears throat> Here you see um, in very simple terms that a centralized model is really the only way to go if you expect to have consistency across the organization. And so we look at being able to build models from various source materials, but being able to drive the model um, from different domains. So this approach, and this is a, a more specific view of the same approach, but you can look at various representations, both from the document hierarchy over here to the more functionally oriented flow of behaviors, activities, and over into the definition of the architecture that would show more physical components. And the physical components might show links, and these links would show interfaces, and your interfaces then begin to show um, the critical data that needs to flow all the way over to what we the simulation that will verify this behavior this function so again having everything in a centralized area is key but the key reason for building a model is that you can go through these activities and everything remains consistent documentation as an output remains consistent because what you're doing is pulling from the model. Uh, so everything always remains consistent because as you generate documentation, as you manage and control the versions of documentation, you can very easily stay up to speed with the model. So as the model changes, the documentation changes, and now you're no longer out of sync, and you're certainly now becoming um, model experts and model stewards instead of librarians of reams of outdated documentation. So this is really the value of the methodology. The value of the methodology is that you can go through these trades, that you can go through these um, risk analysis, and that you can use a centralized database to keep the work products, keep the documentation up to speed. Most importantly, this approach keeps your activities synchronized. Um, it helps you to communicate with the rest of the organization. And this conversation with the organization is really the value of the model. So a lot of times also we get um, consumed with building a model. Our observations in the, in the field is we've helped many customers and many organizations and programs implement model-based systems engineering we see that a lot of people get hung up in building the model and lose sight or lose focus on the value of executing the model. So being able to execute this model is really a key driver for understanding the risks and being able to understand the cost impact and being able to uh, somewhat blur the lines between uh, are you engineering these, these thresholds, these requirements, or are you just simply managing them? And identifying the risks, identifying the cost drivers in a program at a systems level really is the key. So let's talk about that. Um, we're talking now with how we can take what we just learned and communicate with the rest of the organization or reconnect with the organization. How do we take what we learned about this model? How do we take what we've learned about our target or a candidate system and build a model that uh, provides wisdom to the rest of the organization. As we look at the cost and the risk um, reflected in the program, these are common elements, these are common language elements that we can start talking about. We can start talking about the schedule, we can start talking about the integration with product development and certainly, as we mentioned, we talk about the impact on test and evaluation, the impact on verification of the systems. <clears throat> so let's start with probably the most important aspect of a model and the, probably the most important differentiator for a, a document or a static approach, and that's the ability to do these quick sensitivity and uh, assessments, to be able to look at thresholds. Um, as some of you may be familiar with the CAVE, cost as independent variable, this is just a simple concept that articulates 
the effect of cost and the relationship between cost and performance and most importantly identifying what zone you might be in on this uh, knee in the curve. So the knee here shows you where you can build threshold values for uh, performance requirements. It also shows you where you can box out a limit on the ceiling for your cost. And most importantly, it shows you what zone you might be in. So the fact that you have a model now means that you can execute that model multiple times and collect data all along this curve. And understanding changes in the cost or changes in performance and the implication will give you a much better conversation with the capture team. It will empower the capture team to help articulate the, the key acquisition uh, points for the system and ultimately to help win, that, win more of that business. In addition, the risk assessment um, is a key element in reconnecting with the organization because you want to you want to be able to throw up the red flags early, um, hopefully not often, but you want to reveal the risk and the weakness in the model. What you're looking at here is a chart of a, a simulation output. This is an executable model. Uh, some of you may have seen this uh, model. But we're looking at the resource loading of an executable model. This is the output of a simulation of a system model. And this simulation was uh, made possible because we went through the key concepts. We built relationships. We added entities that had certain behaviors. And these behaviors then became key logical points for us to be able to exercise and validate the logic. In addition, these behaviors draw on resources. These resources, for example, can be too low. And so a key risk might be that you have underestimated the resources required to do the job. This simulation shows how a model-based approach can highlight um, a, a zone of deficient resources and fail that over in a way that you can then mitigate and help you engineer the proper thresholds for that resource. For example, computing processor speed. Uh, you can use the simulation to identify the thresholds or the limits for the processing and then reestablish a new set of baselines or a new set of thresholds, rerun the model, and now see that you've got a level pass model. So again, th you can't do this with a static pile of hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. It takes a model-based systems engineering approach to empower the systems organization to be able to come up with these early mitigation plans, these early risk drivers, and be able to highlight and recommend ways to alleviate the problems. Again, this goes to reconnecting with the organization with the proper wisdom and with the proper empowering. So in summary, we have just walked through a few basic concepts. We have introduced the model-based system engineering approach in the context of how it helps you connect with the organization. The systems engineering should be impacting outcome. The, the engineering groups should be impacting outcome, not really just managing documents. The output of this process is what we call a value model. The value comes from exercising the model. And the engine, this is the engine that really empowers the SE decision making team. Connecting with the, the organization really provides the conversation and understanding the sensitivities, the threshold values early on is a key element. Now there's nothing there's nothing in here that says uh, we have to abandon um, our work process, we have to abandon um, the stewardship of requirements, but it does mean that we can really provide a more rich and meaningful set of analysis around those requirements in a way that, that makes sense. So most importantly we bring the system engineering uh, function or in the organization in with the team. We help tie in and the systems engineering organization provides much more 
uh, feedback early on, much more wisdom early on, and really helps shape the direction of the program in a, in a meaningful way. As a follow-up, Vitec Corp, if you're not familiar with our company, we are uh, providers of model-based system engineering solutions. We can provide both uh, tools and methodology along with coaching, training, and tutoring on this specific approach. The model-based system engineering approach is uh, um, equally powerful. It's simple, but if it's approached uh, from the wrong perspective, it can be somewhat daunting. So we help companies, we help organizations simplify and make what appears to be a very complex process into a very simple, useful approach. We urge you to continue in this conversation. Uh, we have set up a community site where you can provide feedback, where you can engage in conversation, online postings, um, and certainly this webinar and links to other materials can be provided. But we really want to hear from you. We really want to understand from you, the community, um, how you see systems engineering and model-based systems engineering unfolding for your organization. So with that, as I say, my name is uh, Brett Malone with Vitech. Uh, we're certainly glad to have you uh, on the webinar today. And at this point, I'm going to pause. We're going to uh, assimilate some of our Q&A and then we'll go into that session. So if you have a question, as I mentioned early on, if you have a question, uh, you can post that by uh, submitting it right in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your GoToWebinar um, control panel. Okay, so we have a question regarding the um, approach to MBSE where uh, how do you do more of a top-down and look at decomposing from requirements uh, before you might know what your solution looks like. And that's a very good point. And um, as we look at the approach, what I'll do is uh, flash back a few slides. The approach can start anywhere, and the approach should start with a proper decomposition of the requirements, a proper analysis of the functional behavior, and then, and only then, the proper assignment of the physical architecture to that behavior. So it's a great question. Model-based methodology allows you to do this. And even when you're at the functional level, the behavior level, um, you can certainly begin to model functional um, be output and look at limitations um, and impact on requirements before you get into a detailed assignment of the of the architecture. So it's a great question. Um, and as we said in the previous slide, the model-based systems engineering approach allows you to start just about anywhere. If you do have a definition of your system and you want to look at a either a re-engineering approach or you want to look at an additional approach, you can do that. If you also have uh, a blank sheet of paper, you can start with that decomposition in proper form. And it certainly will support that. We have a question regarding the um, DODAF model and the human view and certainly providing the representation. So DODAF is a specific um, architectural format where you're looking at certain key representations. Again, as we provide the output from the model, we can provide the output from the model in, in various views and the documentation provides that, um, that view. So. Um, we're working to stay compliant with all of the DODAF specs um, as we are in incorporating the DODAF 2.0. Our, our current release of core provides DODAF 2.0 functionality uh, with all of the views. Good question in terms of the ROI or the, um, the business cost of moving to an MBSE approach. And, you know, the key, the key to implementation is being able to understand where the bottlenecks are now and where where the cost is being in, 